What's up everybody, welcome back again to another episode of Axel's Analysis. As always, I'm the host, the man too cheap to make up his own name, so that's still an Axel Mulligan. Uh, I've got a bit of a cold this week, so you have to, might have to bear with me at some stages during the show. And all sympathy tweets, please send them to at Axel Mulligan. I'm only joking. Uh, NXT was decent this week, much better than last week, I thought. Uh, commentary team was back to the alternating. As I said last week, they didn't alternate between the two teams, but this week we're back to uh, Brennan, Albert, and A. Roy. Good job by them this week. JoJo on ring announcing again. Yeah, same shit as last week. wasn't very good. Um, first part of the show was the usual ascension, fucking decimation of a local team. Uh, quick match, one with a fallen man, short and shit as per fucking usual. Uh, Connor got the pin. And I'm just bored of it. I am bored out of my fucking brains of seeing the Ascension kick the crap out of one bloke for a minute or two. Throw him into his, his partner to knock him off the apron and then hit the fallen man of evening. That's not a credible tag team champions, or not, not a team of credible tag team champions. That's just, that's like a new team coming up. These guys have held the titles for 352 days. That's 13 days short of a full year. Where's the credibility? I, I don't know. If anybody can understand it, if anybody can give me a reason why I should get behind this team, and why I should believe people like Alex Riley when he said, uh, he said something along the lines of, uh, they had to have this tag team tournament because, to name the new number one contenders, because the Ascension had just decimated everybody. Well, no, that's bullshit, Alex Riley, so fuck you. That pissed me off because they've not beaten proper teams. Here's a list of the teams that they defended the belts against that I can remember, and if anybody else can think of any more, just send me a tweet. We've got Corey Graves and Adrian Neville, uh, a couple of weeks after they won the titles from them, you know, mandatory rematch and all that. Too cool at arrival. Hunico and Camacho, a few weeks, it was either before or after that, I don't really remember. Um, El Loco and Callisto at uh, the first takeover. Uh, Tyson Kidd and Sami Zayn about a month, six weeks ago. So I said, if anybody else can think of any more teams, let me know, because I can. You know, five defences in 352 days. People sit there bitching about Dean Ambrose's US title reign. And yet, the announcers, the fans, everybody gets behind the ascension. I know people get behind Dean Ambrose, but they shit on his title reign as US champion. But I don't really see anybody aside from myself and a couple of others shitting on the ascension's title reign. Because it has been crap, let's be fair. Aside from those title defences, you know, they faced Hunico and Camacho a couple of other times in non-title matches. Uh, they faced uh, the American Wolves, or American Pitbulls as they were called. Um, but I can't think of any other proper teams that they faced. I just... No. Um, after the match, they gave their usual, it doesn't matter who we face, crap. and yeah. I'm hoping that they lose to whoever they're facing at TakeOver, which uh, the final for the tournament is next week, so you know we haven't got long to find out. I'm just hoping that whoever it is just beats them, because I don't care if it's the bald villains, I don't care if it's Sin Cara and Callisto, i just fucking bored of these two. Uh, next part of the show was the general manager reveal. Jojo builds it up horrendously for us. Uh, the new general manager is Mr. William Regal himself. Um, the NXT crowd seems pretty happy with it, you know, but then again, who doesn't love William Regal? You know, the guy's dedicated so much time and so much of his life to the business, and he's worked so hard at promoting uh, younger wrestlers uh, to come through over the last two or three years in NXT. So you got to love the guy. You know, he probably is the best person, if you're talking on screen, for the job, because he does love that. Promoting of the next top guy. Uh, he says he's fortunate enough to have been at full sale since the start of NXT, what was it, two or three years ago now? Um, and it's an honour to be named the new general manager. 
Uh, he's got an announcement regarding the title match at TakeOver Part 2, TakeOver the Second, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he calls Adrian Neville down to the ring. Neville comes down all suited and booted and he congratulates Regal for being named as the general manager. Um, he says he's proud like as an Englishman for him, you know, give it the usual, hyping it up to everybody and making himself sound good. Uh, but he's got to ask him one question, and that question is who's next? And that invoked a bit of a Goldberg chant from the crowd, which I thought was quite funny. It was nice to see a crowd actually chanting Goldberg at somebody other than right back for once. Um, he starts to talk about his decision, Regal does, and that brings out Tyson Kidd. The kid comes down and goes, yes, Mr. Regal, I accept off face Adrian Neville, sort of saying it, as if Regal's already announced that Tyson Kidd's going to be his opponent. Um, yeah, he's sort of bigging himself up, Tyson is, and we get an, another interruption this time from Tyler Breeze. And uh, Breeze tells Regal, this ergo doesn't deserve a title shot. And uh, he had a bit of a soft spot with Tyson when he turned around to him and he said, uh, everybody deserves a title shot more than Ty- more than Tyson Kidd, including his wife. And that just got a, ah, oh, from the crowd, like, oh, shit, you didn't do that. That was quite funny, I thought, because you don't really get much character other than the gimmick for Tyler Breeze. So it was good to see that he actually sort of put a little bit more in this week for that. Uh, we get another interruption this time from Sami Zayn sporting a Rancid t-shirt, which I'm a big Rancid fan, so that's pretty cool to see. Um, it's always great to see any array of t-shirts that he wears, really. Um, he said Tyson isn't, uh, sorry, he said Tyler isn't right very often, and but this time he is right. And the reason that he's right is because there is people that deserve, or there are people that deserve it more than Tyson Kidd. And he said there's people who deserve it more than Tyler Breeze. And he says, well, I'm the person who deserves it more. Uh, Neville jumps in and he says that his own opinion, uh, he, sorry, he said he's got his own opinion and he wants to face all three of them. And Regal said, well, that wasn't what I was thinking about doing, but, you know, let's do it anyway. So I'm not, I'm not really into Fatal Four Ways, but I think this one could be quite good with the talent that's on show. You know, I mean, Sami Zayn, He's had the match of the night for the last two, uh, you know, NXT specials. Tyson Kidd, great wrestler. Him and Adrian Neville had a great match at the last uh, event. And then also Tyler Breeze, you know, he had the great match with Tyson, with uh, Sami Zayn at the last event. So, you know, you got all, you got all the ingredients there for a fantastic match. And I think, you know, it could easily, this takeover, um, with the card about shaping up, you know, it could easily top the last one. I don't think it top a rival. I don't think a rival will be topped. Um, at least not with this card anyway. But, you know, it's, it's, it's looking to be a really good show so far. That's the first official match that's, match that's been announced. I'll get to a couple of others later on. Um, just a note on Regal as well with his uh, role as general manager. I'm hoping that he has more of a prominent role on the show than what Dusty did and what JBL did. I mean, a JBL being a general manager has made no sense to me at all because he's never really been one for promoting the, the youngsters of the company. Whereas everybody knows that Dusty's worked down at the Performance Center. He was the, the first commissioner of NXT, later renamed to be general manager. Um, he was sort of ousted from that position on screen because of the, you know, the, the disrespect that he allegedly showed to Stephanie on an episode of Raw. You know, I'm, I'm hoping Regal has a bit more of a prominent role, as I say, because, you know, he's he can work the mic, he can put over a young guy. You know, he's put over young guys in the ring. You know, he did it with uh, Chris Hero, Cassius so no, He did it with Cesaro. You know, he, he doesn't have to wrestle to put a guy over. He can do it with his words. You know, he's great on the mic, so... You know, I'm hoping that we do see more of Regal than what we saw of JBL and Dusty. Uh, but it's a shame that he won't be on commentary, actually, just to hear his, uh, his typical British sayings, like when he called, uh, what was it he called CJ Parker a dirty, filthy shower dodge and get? I mean, that was brilliant, but, you know, we don't get that. We're not going to get that from now on, unfortunately. Unless he plays the uh, Nigel McGuinness role, of course, where, you know, he's the, 
the matchmaker or the general manager, and he comes out to commentate on half of the pay-per-view, which I'm all for that. I love it when Nigel McGuinness uh, commentates for Ring of Honor. I love William Regal on commentary, so let's hope that they do something like that. Um, after Well, the next part of the show, we had a little um, segment between Veronica Lane and William Regal. Regal basically promoted the main event that he just made for TakeOver. And then he also made the main event for tonight, or for this show. Tyson Kidd and Tyler Breeze versus Sami Zayn and Adrian Neville. I've got one word for you, Regal, and I'm going to say it three times. Holla, holla, holla. Teddy Long booking all over that. The next match was uh, a rematch between Sasha Banks and Bailey from a couple of weeks ago. Um, what pissed me off with this was at the start when JoJo did the ring announcement. She said the next, the following match is a Divas match. Why do we need to know that it's a Divas match? I think we can clearly tell that both Bailey and Sasha Banks are females. You know, I'd be a bit worried if she said it's a Divas match and you got fucking Tyson Kidd versus Adrian Neville or something like that. You know, they don't announce like male wrestling matches as the following superstars match is scheduled for one fall. So why the hell do they need to do it with Divas matches? I don't get it. I've never understood it. I've only really sort of sat up and noticed it this week enough to be pissed off with it. But it's WWE. Hey, ho, don't need to say any more, do I? Um, Sasha was quite aggressive in the match and like she was as impressive as she always is. Match didn't last very long. Bailey had a little flurry of offense at the beginning. Sasha quickly took over, kicked the crap out of her. And then Bailey had the John Cena win. She hit the Bailey to or the belly to Bailey. One, two, three. Sasha's lost, and poor Sasha Banks. I'll give her a hug. Bailey's not going to, but I'll give her a hug. Um, Post match, Renee Young came came into the ring, and she asked Bailey what it would mean to be the NXT Women's Champion. Renee Young going back to the stupid fucking questions. She said, um, "You know, it'd be." So it's something that she's prepared for, it'd be an honour, so on and so forth, you know, the usual shtick. Um, and that takeover in two weeks' time, she's going to turn her dream into a reality. Uh, Charlotte comes out, she interrupts Bailey, says that being champion is a huge responsibility. And somebody in the crowd made a bit of a noise, and Charlotte turned around and she basically told him to shut up. And it was brilliant because it invoked a reaction from more people in the crowd. So Charlotte's um, crowd interaction there was really good. She did that two or three times in the segment, and it worked really well for what she was trying to get at. So, you know, fair play. Um, Bailey basically said that Charlotte isn't taking her as a serious threat, and she's going to win. Um, Charlotte said she's not going to win. You know, you might as well just give up. Uh, Char- uh, Bailey offered a handshake to Charlotte, and Charlotte just blew her off and walked out the ring. It was good to see, though, because at one point in that little segment, um, Bailey's sort of like, she's quite the timid kind of character, but she actually stood up to Charlotte. Um, She sort of got up in her grill, and she said to her, look, you know, I'm here. Because she was talking to the crowd. She's like, look, I'm here. Listen to me. Talk to me. Don't talk to them. And that was really good. You know, I thought, you know, there's a little bit of a development on the Bailey character. So any, any kind of character development which is going in the right way is obviously a positive move. A little bit of a positive move here for Bailey. I was hoping that she was going to smack her, but that probably wasn't just going to happen, was it? Um, just on, on the match, though, I was, I was quite it's sad to see that Sasha's being sort of like jobbed, not jobbed out, I suppose, but she's losing in that kind of manner. You know, if the match lasted another four or five minutes, I would have had no problem with it. And if Bailey had, had a, if it was a bit more even, like if Bailey had, had a bit more offense in the match. But it was completely dominated by Sasha, and she lost. It's it's it's, it's like what um, some people call the John Cena syndrome. You know, it's it's not good really because you don't want that underdog thing for everybody. I mean, I know John Cena is not an underdog as such, um, but he often has that sort of gets his ass kicked for fifteen minutes, and he wins with his five moves of doom, similar to what Bailey did here. And it's just, it's just a shame that. Sasha was the only realistic person they could have put in that position. I mean, maybe they could have used somebody from the main roster, maybe somebody like Alicia Fox or something like that, but sadly that to use Sasha Banks and 
you know, I'm a big Sasha fan. I've said it before. I'm a big advocate for Sasha. But, hey ho. Um, the promo was decent, though. Charlotte worked the crowd well, as I said. And, uh, you know, Bailey held her own as well. So, you know, I can't fault that little part of it. It's just the match wasn't. didn't work for me. Next match was uh, Bullshit Dempsey versus Angelo Dawkins. And Angelo Dawkins looks like a kid who's lost on his way to school. You know, he's got his little baseball cap on, his rucksack. And this match was basically, it was like, if you think The Simpsons, you've got Nelson versus Milhouse. And that's exactly what this was, you know. It was the bully kicking the crap out of the nerd, winning the match quite easily. Short match, but Dempsey dominated it, as you can expect. Um, one with the bulldozer. Um, but the commentators, the big thing about the match was the commentators announced that at TakeOver, you know, we've got Bull Dempsey versus uh, Mojo Rawley. And it's, it's going to be one of those things. It's either going to be really painful to watch or it's going to be one of those really good hard-hitting matches. And i tell you what, if, if Bull Dempsey loses to that fucking hyperdrive, there's going to be so many people pissed off because that is one of the worst finishers in the WWE right now. Just a, a god-awful finishing move. So if Bull Dempsey, the way they've built him up, if he loses to that, I've got no problem if he loses with like a like a surprise like schoolboy or I can't see him using it, but a small package or something like that. But for me, Paul Dempsey's got to win the match the way that it's been booked so far. And then as well, it would further the feud. You know, to go on another two or three weeks on TV. You know, have like Dempsey win at TakeOver, Mojo win in say two or three weeks' time. And then you have the rubber match two or three weeks' time after that. And you've got to have that as the main event of NXT, in my opinion, for that particular show, if they do go down that route. And whoever wins, I'm, I'm just hoping that both guys are improving enough in the performance center. You obviously know these tapings are several weeks ago. So, you know, there's always time to improve. There's always room to improve. And I'm hoping that both of these guys can, you know, just have improved enough to put on a decent show, on a live show. Or put on a decent match on a live show, give the crowd and give the audience at home what they want to see, which is a decent wrestling match or a decent fight, if anything. You know, I think Ball could deliver a decent fight, but I'm not so sure about Mojo. But we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Uh, Devin Taylor had a, well, she was saying an interview. She didn't even ask the question. Uh, uh, she had the Legionnaires. A uh, quick promo where basically Marcus Louis just accepted Enzo Amore's challenge on behalf of Sylvester the Fort. Uh, Sly wasn't too happy with it, but Marcus was sort of like convincing it. I presume he was convincing him. He was talking in French, so I couldn't understand him. I don't speak French. I speak a bit of German, but hey, I barely speak English, me. Main event type, Zayna Neville versus Breeze and Tyson Kidd. It was, it was a typical tag team main event, really. There was nothing that sort of made me sort of stand up and think, oh, God, that was really cool. But it was just, no, it was, I mean, like, the one thing that the crowd popped for was when uh, Neville did the, um, he did a corkscrew uh, moonsault off of uh, Zane's back. Well, I've seen it before. If, in my opinion, it could be deemed as quite a dangerous move. I don't wrestle. I don't know, obviously. You know, you've got a bloke who weighs 200 pounds on your back. He's got a, sort of put pressure down to be able to jump off and spring off. It could hurt the guy's back, in my opinion, but hey ho, I'm a fan, what do I know? Um, the result of the match was good, but I don't like the way it was done. I'll talk you through it, if, if you haven't seen it. Basically, Adrian uh, took Breeze down with a roundhouse kick near the corner of the ring, went up to the top rope, looked to hit the red arrow. Breeze got up, knocked uh, Neville's feet out from underneath him. <coughs> Excuse me. Knocked Neville's feet out from underneath him. And he sort of split the difference, as I like to call it, on the top rope, you know, over the turnbuckle. Um, Breeze was sort of like, he was struggling to get up. He was up, but he was struggling to get up. And he turned around, and just as he, he was about to get hit with a halluva kick, he moved out of the way. And Sammy caught Neville flush in the face with a halluva kick. Neville fell down to the canvas and Zane's thinking, he's like holding his head like, oh shit, I've just fucking knocked out my tag team partner. Um, Breeze sort of scrambled away to his corner. He stood up. Tyson tagged himself in. 
And Breeze is like, you know, what the fuck are you doing? So Tyson threw Breeze into Zane, who hit him with a blue thunderbomb. And Tyson then, uh, oh, well, Zane didn't know that the tag had been made, the blind tag. Uh, he sort of noticed when the referee said, look, he's not the legal man. He got to his feet and Tyson threw him out through the ropes. And then he pinned Neville, one, two, three. Neville was down for almost a minute. How incredibly weak do they want to make their champion look? I wouldn't have been so bothered if they'd have got Neville to stagger to his feet. And uh, Tyson went to the top rope and he hit the blockbuster. No problem with that. Or if he locked in a sharpshooter or the dungeon lock or anything. But they left him prone on the mat for almost a minute. Which is more than enough time. I mean, I've seen people kick out of the halupa kick before. Plenty of times. And the way that it was done just made Neville look incredibly weak, in my opinion. And it should have been done completely differently, as I say. But I don't book the show. You know, it's down to the guys like Triple H. Yeah. You know, I think Triple H does a good job on the whole of NXT. But the match, the finish of the match was just booked completely wrong, really. I mean, whatever agent did it, he just slap, in my opinion. But hey-ho. As I said earlier, I'm just a fan. What do I know? Uh, Post match, Neville, se- uh, sorry, Neville Tyson, kid celebrated the win. He was sort of propped up in the corner, and he didn't realise it. Sami Zayn came in and <laughs> took his head off with a halluva kit. Um, so Sami's the only person standing. He like he he's, he stood there in the ring. He's got this real look of intensity in his eyes. You don't really see that that often from Sami, and it was really good to see because. It's just, again, it, like Bailey earlier, it just expands something called the Sami Zayn character. And it worked. It was perfect. It was really well done, I thought. Um, they walked over to the corner of the ring where he and Neville were tagging on the ring step. NXT Championship belt. He picked it up and he looked at it as if he just won it. He was sort of holding it in both of his hands, collapsed to his knees, and the show just went off the air. And I thought it was a really good way to end the show. I just, as I said, I just didn't like the ending to the match. Um, just needed a more believable finish for me, but hey ho. Uh, overall rating, I've given it a seven out of ten. Very good show. Um, Storyline has moved on very nicely in all the matches that we had. <coughs> Excuse me, aside from the Ascension, of course. Uh, you know, you've got Bull Dempsey being built up. You've got Bailey being built up. You had all four guys from the uh, main event at Takeover in the main event of this week's NXT. Just really well done, you know. So fair play to him this week. Very good show. Uh, the one bit of news for this week. Um, Charlotte's apparently going to the main roster fairly shortly. Um, this is according to the dirt sheets with Ric Flair likely to be in her corner. And I think that's more so to give Ric Flair something to do because as I've said before, you know, Charlotte sort of won me over as a fan. But I don't think she's by any means ready for the main roster. You know, the one person who is ready, in my opinion, who uh, who could sort of be the next one to go up, or should be the one to go up next, in my opinion, is Sasha Banks. And she's not ready yet either. No need to get Charlotte up there just yet. You know, why not have Rick Flair just managing her in NXT, getting working with a guy like Dolph on the main roster, maybe? I don't know. Makes... It's, I know they weren't keen on putting Flair with Dolph anyway, which, fair enough. But don't put somebody up to the main roster just so Ric Flair can manage them. Why the hell did they hire the guy if they had nothing for him to do? I know he's Ric Flair. You know, he's a legend. Everybody loves Ric Flair. But, you know, they're firing guys because they've got no money. Or that the money's not there to be spent, and yet they're hiring guys, but they've got nothing for him to do. I don't get it. I really don't get it. The thought process sometimes with these guys is just beyond me. But, you know, fair play to Charlotte. You know, if she goes out there and she succeeds, you know, fair play. You know, she, she'd be like wrestling to a wider audience. Whether people take to her or not is obviously yet to be seen, but we'll see what, we'll see how it goes. We'll see what they do. Uh, the birthdays this week, not very many, and they're very well spread apart. Uh, August the 25th, so that would have been Monday, would have been the birthday of Crash Holly, would have been 43. Uh, Ivan Koloff, 
former um, WWF champion, or was he WWF champion, whatever way it was, uh, he would have been 72. Sorry, he was 72. Uh, August the 27th, Sergeant Slaughter, 66. The Great Carly, 42. And Jazz, 41. John Cena, if you want to learn how to do an STF, watch some jazz matches. Brilliant STF. Uh, August 28th, Linda Miles. Remember, uh, who did she play? She was the manager for the Basham Brothers, Shaniqua. Like the, dressed to put in all the dominatrix gear and all that shit. Not my kind of thing, but apparently Doug and Danny like that kind of shit. She was uh, 35, and then we skipped three days to, uh, there was nothing before yesterday or today. Uh, so tomorrow, August the 31st, Jeff Hardy, 37, and uh, Mickey James will be turning 35. Uh, the grappling greats for this week, I said last week, um, I covered Ed the Strangler Lewis, um, part of the famous uh, Gold Dust Trio, nothing to do with Dustin Rhodes. Um, I said this week I was going to do the Gold Dust Trio, so... Got a little, well, rather a large piece of the Gold Dust Trio. I think it's just more of how I've written it out more than anything. Um, I've started doing blogging again and I've kind of gone a bit weird with my writing for this, like taking my notes. So it's probably, got, it's probably looks a lot longer than what it's actually going to be. Um, basically, after Frank Gotch, um, wrestling was struggling um, as the fans grew tired of watching deliberately slow matches like Gotch was like, one of the last of a dying breed and wrestling matches after that became deliberately slow paced and rather boring and basically these guys got together you had uh, Billy Sandow uh, uh, Joseph Tutsmont and Ed Strangler Lewis uh, six time world heavyweight champion uh, Tutsmont discovered a solution um, basically to completely transform the world of professional wrestling um, and his new style, which he came up with, uh, he integrated so many different things into it. There was Greco-Roman, there was freestyle, you know, boxing, martial arts, all these different kinds of things integrated into one type of uh, fight. And he called the new style was known as slam bang Western style wrestling, and it was basically scripted wrestling as as we would know it, or worked. Um, and it basically became an instant success uh, in the 1920s. And although many matches, like for years before that, were fixed, uh, these were the first worked uh, matches with scripts and storylines. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but it was it was Tutsmont who basically perfected the the art of the finish of a match. You know, real sort of booking and how matches would pan out. Um, it's also believed. Uh, that Mont personally became, came up with 90% of finishes for matches and 60% of finishing holds. He was a wrestler himself. Uh, he was trained by uh, Martin Farmer Burns, as were sort of over a thousand other people. Um, he also came up with the idea for a no contest finish. Um, again, something to help with storylines, to help sort of, you know, this isn't over kind of thing. Uh, interest grew in their shows as you know this slam bang western style wrestling took off interest grew um, they started moving from like small uh, like opera houses and things like that into bigger sporting arenas uh, due to the larger crowds Billy Sandow was able to recruit hundreds of wrestlers under contract so that they, they weren't to work anywhere else they would work simply for the gold dust trio um, and they could actually give them a decent wage as well for the time. And they had hundreds of wrestlers within their pool. Uh, and they became the first national promotion and were the first to take, sorry, the first to present a product with storylines. Uh, they recognised Lewis as their top talent, Ed the Strangler Lewis. And he was their go-to guy, kind of like John Cena is now for the WWE. Ed Strangler Lewis was their go-to guy. And basically, when the interest started to sort of Fade in Lewis as a dominant champion, they would put him against a popular con uh, contender or challenger, and they would put the challenger over just to regain interest so people would start watching the shows again. And then once they had it where they needed it to be, um, the challengers that would beat Lewis, um, like when the interest started to fade again, they'd build Lewis up as a strong contender or challenger, and Lewis would then regain the belt. 
simple booking, which as we know today, you know, as I said, John Cena. Um, basically, the gold dust tree, they eventually dissolved in uh, 1928. There was a power struggle between uh, Tutsmont and Sandai's brother, uh, Max Bowman. What he had to do with it, I'm not sure. I tried doing a bit of research on it, but I couldn't find the reason why he was involved in it all. Uh, Sandai, yeah, Sandai's brother, uh, Max Bullman, and Lewis and Sandai eventually split soon after. Sandai was, uh, Lewis's manager for his matches. And, you know, there was some sort of disagreement between, I think, the, regarding Lewis's conditioning. Sandai didn't agree with how he was doing his conditioning, and they basically went their separate ways. But the legacy they left was, well, as I see, she wrestling now. Uh, you know, scripted storylines, uh, work matches, and, you know, just the product as we have it, you know, how you see it now is slam bang Western style wrestling, really. Um, Montwood, uh, Toots Mont would later to pick it, excuse me, start that again. Toots Mont would later become the mentor for Vince McMahon Sr. and helped him form the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. And it was Mont's idea to push Bruno San Martino as the number one guy in 1963. Obviously, San Martino went to, went on to beat uh, Buddy Rogers in some like 47 seconds. The rest is history. Eight-year title reign. Um, and current WWE star Damien Sandow. I mentioned this last week, but I'll say it again. Damien Sandow adopted his name in honor of Billy Sandow. Uh, Billy Sandow was basically known as an intellectual. Uh, genius basically within the wrestling business. Sandow, obviously, you know, the intellectual savior of the masses, a clever character, a clever guy. Took the last name, took the idea that uh, Billy Sandow was very intelligent, and hey presto, you've got Damien Sandow who's now uh, dressing up as whoever he fucking feels like. Yeah, I think it was The Miz this week. Anyway, that's the end of the show. Thanks for listening, everybody. Um, as always, make sure you look out for me on Twitter at Axel Mulligan. I've started posting pictures of the grappling greats on the Axel's Analysis page at Axel's Analysis. I never sort of promote that page on the show because I very rarely use it, but I'm going to start using it again for things like this. Um, look out for the Facebook page, uh, Axel's Analysis. I'm starting to write reviews for Ring of Honor as well. Getting a bit mm, funny with it at the moment because I'm going a bit too long-winded with them, so I'll probably start that properly as of next week. Um, but yeah, that page on that'll be a page on Facebook, and it's called the Review of Honor. So look out for Review of Honor on Facebook and give that a like. Um, shout outs as always, Tim Vicious and Tim underscore Vicious and Tim. He tried putting me over as the new NXT general manager. Unfortunately, it was my fellow Englishman, William Regal. Make sure you look out for Tim. As I say, at Tim Vicious, at Tim underscore Vicious. Look out for his YouTube show, Vicious Rants. Always reviews rules and pay-per-views, etc. A really good show. Uh, you've got Sunday Segway podcast. Make sure you check them out on uh, Twitter, at Sunday Segway. Look for their Facebook page as well. I never remember to do like to mention this, but if you look out for their Facebook page, just put a little sort of, uh, like your opinions of rules and pay-per-views, etc., on their Facebook page. They um, always put a little status up where you can put comments on there. Um, yeah, so make sure you do that. Uh, listen, you can listen to them on YouTube, uh, Podomatic, iCloud, I, iCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher Radio. Uh, James's Wrestling Ramble. Uh, look out for James at James Powers 33 on Twitter. And look out for his page on, I believe he's got a page on Facebook, is James's Wrestling Ramble. Um, he's definitely got one on Twitter, James's Wrestling Ramble. You can listen to that on uh, YouTube, uh, Mixcloud and Podomatic. Uh, at Pro Wrestling Smart Talk on Facebook and at PW Smart Talk on Twitter. Make sure you look out for Nick's uh, stuff, what he does on his website. Uh, you've got uh, at Wrestling Rambles. Check out WrestlingRambles.com as well. And then also uh, Tony Walker, at Tony underscore Walker. Uh, check out his Wrestling Matters podcast. Uh, you can find the page for that on Twitter, at WM Podcast. You can listen to that on uh, iTunes, YouTube, Mix, and uh, Podomatic, I believe. Uh, that's all. Thanks for listening, everybody. And I will be back again next week. <laughs>